Hello everybody and welcome to another video. Today I'm going to be doing something a bit unorthodox. I won't be going over the daily events that occurred in Ukraine. I'll be analyzing how the midterm elections in the United States could perhaps affect the course of the Russia-Ukraine war. And so when I talk about the midterm elections, I'm talking about the elections that will be going on in the Senate and the House, most importantly. But also there's going to be a wide array of local elections, gubernatorial elections. And so those are all important for domestic policy or local policy. But of course, there is a role for the House and the Senate in regards to foreign policy, which I'm more concerned about because this channel is really devoted to talking about what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. And so I want to talk about how the results in the elections that will be conducted on November 8th could affect potentially sanctions or the amount of aid that Ukraine is allotted. And so I have the Senate map opened up uh, over here. This is the current composition. You have 50 Republicans and 50 Democrats. And so this means that the Democrats have a majority because the Democrats, they have the president and the vice president. And so Kamala Harris, she's the vice president Democrat. And so she could be the tiebreaker if there's a 50-50 vote in the Senate. And then uh, I also have the House map over here. You can see Democrats have a 10 representative lead. And so they have a trifecta right now, which means they have control of not only the Senate in the House, but also the presidency. And so it is much easier for them to pass legislation that they see fit. But obviously there is going to be a few representatives from their party or a few senators from their party who disagree and so that sort of like puts a wrench in whatever plans they have to pa pass plans domestically so like the most notable examples i would say for the senate is like in west virginia you have joe manchin he's a pretty conservative leaning democrat and so he's been voting against a lot of the provisions that democrats have supported and also you have in uh, arizona kristen cinema she's also been a vocal opponent of some of the economic policies, whether, whether it be like a $15 minimum wage or some like higher amount of spending on infrastructure, that sort of stuff. But none of that is really important for Russia, Ukraine, because really most of the Senate is in unison in regards to this topic. And so really there was only opposition to the Ukraine aid bill, and I'm talking specifically about the one that allotted $40 billion to military and economic aid for Ukraine, which was passed, if I'm not mistaken, in May, just a few months ago. There was only really opposition from 11 senators, and interestingly, they were all from the Republican Party. There were zero Democrats in opposition, not even uh, Bernie Sanders from Vermont. And so I'm going to list all of those senators now and then we're going to go to the house and talk about things there because i do think the situation there is more interesting than in the senate so in the senate the republicans that voted against the aid bill were uh, marsha blackburn from tennessee and then also bill Haggerty from tennessee so both senators from there then you had also um, john boozman from arkansas you had mike braun from indiana Mike Crapo from Idaho, Mike Lee from Utah, Josh Hawley from Missouri, and Josh Hawley, he's probably one of the most vocal critics of the Ukraine aid. He's been very skeptical. If you uh, follow him on Twitter, he's always uh, writing against that sort of stuff. He's really a part of the new guard of the Republican Party, the so-called America First movement. He's a part of that sort of milieu. He's much more isolationist so he sort of shares that in common with some of the libertarians like thomas massey who's a representative from kentucky and senator rand paul and so you really have a lot of republicans sort of shifting towards this isolationist um policy position which is sort of different than their new conservative predecessors like george w bush dick cheney all of those people really that's the old guard and they're represented by people like mitch mcconnell who is the senate majority leader uh well not now but if the republicans were to take the senate he will be the senate majority leader 
Right now, he's the Senate Minority Leader. He leads the Republicans. And also people like Lindsey Graham, who is a senator from South Carolina, they're really some of the more vocal, outspoken interventionists. And they are also people who have been very supportive of aid to Ukraine and sanctions against Russia. And so really, you're seeing some of the more uh, young candidates, especially from the Republican side, being more skeptical of the aid to Ukraine. And so Josh Hawley, he's a very big example of that. But you also have some older senators who uh, really, they don't have a concrete ideology. They're just like your normal Republicans. And interestingly, they've also oppose this so like cynthia loomis in wyoming roger marshall in kansas and tommy tuberville in alabama all of whom were really just uh, establishment republicans but let's not forget about Rand paul he is of course from kentucky he is probably the biggest opponent regarding any aid to ukraine he has been really outspoken from the start in this regard especially when it was like universally uh, supported by most of the Senate. Now there's a bit more opposition, but he was really the only person at the time in the Senate to speak out against it. And he would, he was really part of the reason why a lot of these uh, bills appropriating funds to Ukraine were held up because he would be railing against it and sort of obstructing the process of passing the law. But anyway, let's now move on to the House where we did have the vote about $40 billion being sent to Ukraine. And really the most notable opposition was from the GOP. There was actually zero nay votes from Democrats, but there were 57 from the Republicans. This does mean though that the vast majority of Republicans still voted for the aid to Ukraine, about 75% of them. And then of course, all Democrats that were present at the roll call vote voted as well and so the most notable gop representatives who voted against the aid to ukraine are louis gomert from texas matt gates from florida who was recently embroiled in some fbi investigations that were later uh, dropped and he was cleared of wrongdoing also you have uh, lauren bober from colorado madison cawthorn from north carolina He's uh, over here. He just lost his primary a few months ago to a different Republican. Paul Gosar from Arizona, who's really been seen as one of the leaders of the America First movement. And so given the fact that he does have this belief in isolationism or like non-interventionism in other countries' affairs, it does make sense that he would be opposed to a lot of these policies. You also have Marjorie Taylor Greene from Georgia. She's actually directly called out the Ukrainian government and uh, especially like Vladimir Zelensky. And so she's ruffled a lot of feathers with Ukraine and she's voted against all of the aid bills, also voted against sanctions against Russia. You also have Jim Jordan from Ohio, who is really one of the higher ranking Republicans in the House of Representatives. So it is interesting. He's not currently the the minority leader for the Republicans in the House. That is Kevin McCarthy from um, this district over here. I think it's the 23rd district in California. And McCarthy, he did vote for the aid bill. But uh, Jim Jordan, he he's probably looking to be the next Republican leader in the House once McCarthy retires, which is going to be in a while. But Jim Jordan is really setting himself up for that position. And so it's good. It's an important thing to note that he is really um, bucked orthodoxy in comparison to a lot of these other Republicans. Also, we have Thomas Massey from Kentucky. Thomas Massey, he is, I'm pretty sure, the representative from this district or this district in Kentucky. And so he's probably the most hardcore isolationist because he does identify as a libertarian he is a republican just because it's easier to get elected that way but in terms of his ideology it aligns much more with the libertarian party he's one of the only representatives to vote against a lot of these spending bills and so he just like flat out rejects any sort of government spending being used especially for stuff like the war in ukraine 
Now, another important piece of legislation that was voted upon in the House much earlier on in the war in early March was about an oil ban from uh, Russia and also banning Russia from participating in the SWIFT financial system. And so there was almost unanimous agreement. This was especially when the criticism of Russia was very harsh and there was just a, a lot of condemnation coming um, out across the entire globe. And so you did see a lot of these representatives that later on started speaking out against Ukraine originally holding this position that Russia needed to be stopped and sanctioned. And so they sort of flip-flopped on that. And so only 17 people voted against the sanctions on Russia compared to 57 later on voting for the Ukraine aid bill. So of those 17 people who voted against the bill in the House of Representatives, 15 were from the Republican Party. And so you had the usual Republicans, really the ones that I mentioned previously, people like Paul Gosar, like Madison Cawthorn, Matt Gates, um, Lauren Boebert, MTG, Thomas Massey, of course. These people were against the sanctions. And then actually you had two Democrats as well, Cori Bush from Missouri. I am pretty sure she represents this district over here, uh, the St. Louis one over here. And then also Ilhan Omar, and she represents the district in, um, I think it's Minneapolis, St. Paul area. And so those two people, they were originally against the sanctions against Russia. And really their stance was coming from this more like progressive perspective, saying that it would have negative effects on the Russian people and on the European people. And so they were originally opponents of this. But as time went on, they really started to associate more with the mainstream democratic position and they've actually been confronted by these um like anti-ukrainian protesters very recently sort of speaking out against them for supporting the 40 billion dollar aid bill and different appropriation bills giving money to ukraine and so they've also flip-flopped on their position since the start of the war but in the different direction and so there are actually really no democrats that hold differing opinions on the specific topic. Something very interesting though is that four days ago there was a letter that was released from the Progressive Caucus of the House and so the Progressive Caucus is probably like the most far left group of the House of Representatives. So you have people like Pramila Jayapal from Washington, she's the head of that caucus. Also uh, people like Mark Bakan from Wisconsin, um, of course, you have the squad, so like AOC from the New York City area. Also, Cori Bush, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, Jamal Bowman, people like that. And so they actually penned the letter and signed it. And in the letter was basically urging Joe Biden to like use his power to de-escalate the situation in Russia to sort of work with the two leaders of Russia and Ukraine respectively to come to a ceasefire. And so this got a lot of backlash online and also from different politicians that weren't in the Progressive Caucus. And so like not even a day later, Pramila Jayapal retracted the letter and she said that it was a mistake and that it was probably like a staffing error and that the letter had actually been drafted in July and for whatever reason it was now released in October. And so that's just interesting. It could, it could show how politics changes over time because I can tell you in July, the situation for Ukraine was much different in the sense that many people were thinking that Ukraine was on its last legs because remember, that was when the battles in Severodonetsk and Lysychansk were going on and you had the Russians almost encircling the Ukrainian units in the area. Some actually did get encircled and captured as POWs. Most were able to escape though. Anyway, it wasn't a very good situation for Ukraine. They weren't really gaining ground in any specific region. And so people were just getting tired of hearing about it in the media constantly. So at the time, there was this thought that they would eventually have to cave in to Russian demands. Of course, now the Ukrainians have much more breathing space after they were able to launch their offensives in Harrison and Kharkiv, which have uh, stalled now, of course, as we're going into the winter and with um, the current rainy season. 
but it did change the views of a lot of American politicians. Now they're less likely to speak out against Ukraine, especially on the Democratic side. On the Republican side, the situation is much different. Over there, you're seeing more and more Republicans start to speak out. And again, this is really due to the fact that the base has turned into this uh, like America first movement, which means that the um, interests of America are prioritized over that of any foreign countries. And so a lot of these politicians are feeling the heat. They don't want to get um, like ousted in their primaries. They want to have leadership positions. And so a lot of people are sort of shifting their views on Ukraine's. So someone like Kevin McCarthy, who voted for sanctions, he voted for aid to Ukraine. He's now actually saying that there's a good chance that additional aid won't be sent to Ukraine if the Republicans take over the House in the upcoming midterms. So I'm just going to quote the minority leader, leader of the GOP in the House, Kevin McCarthy himself. Look at what he said over here. I think people are going to be sitting in a recession and they're not going to write a blank check to Ukraine. They just won't do it. It's not a free blank check. And then there's things the Biden administration is not doing domestically, not doing the border, and people begin to weigh that. Ukraine is important, but at the the same time, it can't be the only thing they do, and it can't be a blank check. So basically, he's bringing up all these like domestic issues and saying that the main focus should be, say, on the border, on crime, inflation, cost of living, all of these issues, which are really paramount to the average American. And so he really sees that there's less interest from regular people. And so he's sort of shifting away from his earlier positions. Meanwhile, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House at the moment, and basically the leader of the Democrats in the House, she has said that she's confident that the aid to Ukraine will keep flowing, even if the Republicans win in the House. And so I want to actually analyze that scenario because it is very likely that Republicans will win the House. They just need to flip a few seats, and there are many vulnerable seats, specifically in places like New York. I'll just highlight some of the key areas where there could be seats flipped. In this area over here in New York, there could be one like flipped in Maine. There could be some flipped in New Jersey. There could be some seats that are flipped perhaps in Iowa perhaps in Florida, there could be one in California. There are several seats that are pretty contested. Same thing with Arizona and Washington. And so they just pick up like a few seats here and there from each state. And eventually the numbers will start to add up. And you can see the Republicans really gaining 30, 35 seats in the House compared to what they had beforehand. And so that would give them a pretty sizable majority. And I could do like another video specifically analyzing each race over here. But just know that it's pretty likely that the Republicans will take the House. And so if that happens, Kevin McCarthy will become the Speaker of the House. What this means is that he can actually choose which bills are voted upon. So if there's a bill about Ukraine aid and he opposes it, he can theoretically just not put that bill up for a vote. And then that aid bill would never be voted upon in the house and it can't be sent to the senate so basically all bills related to raising revenue have to be introduced in the house first and then they get voted upon in the senate and so there's this rule that is called the hazard rule and this is really something that is more of a norm it has been for about 30 years in the um like republican space in the house of representatives So basically, whenever they have control of the speakership, they have a vote within their party, within the representatives from the Republican Party, and they decide whether they agree on the bill. And if a majority of the Republicans in the House want this bill to pass, then it gets put on to a floor vote. And then all the representatives can vote on it, and then they'll just determine whether it passes or not. And so there is a good chance that the majority of Republicans will still want to pass some sort of additional aid to Ukraine. There have been calls from the House Majority Leader, uh, sorry, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell to add additional like air defense systems or long range rockets and additional defense aid, humanitarian aid, financial aid. That is something that is on his 
mind right now. So it is certainly possible that the majority of Republicans will support aid to Ukraine and then it would pass via the Hastert rule. And then it would be just brought up to a House vote where the Democrats would vote in unison and then at least a chunk of the Republicans, perhaps even the majority, would vote in favor of it. And then it would, of course, pass the House. So then moving into the Senate, there really isn't enough changes to see anything significant happening in the Senate because there's only a few candidates running that I have researched on that have differing views regarding Ukraine. So I'm going to mention the three that are um, most notable. In Arizona, you have Blake Masters. He's running to oust Mark Kelly, the astronaut and now senator from Arizona. He has a pretty good chance of winning this election. He's about like two points or one point down in the polls. And so it's certainly a possibility that he takes a seat. And he was recently on Ron Paul's show, and I watched the entire thing. He was talking about how he supports the Ukrainian cause, but that he does not want to give them further military aid. And he, what he says is that it would escalate the situation. So that's his position. Then in Ohio, Rob Portman, the current Republican senior senator, is retiring. And so there's a race between Representative Tim Ryan from the Democrats and J.D. Vance. J.D. Vance is one of the new America First Republicans. He is supported by the likes of Peter Thiel, who is a um, pretty prominent billionaire. He's been pouring in a lot of money to like America First candidates like Blake Masters. And so given Ohio's nature in the fact that J.D. Vance is leading in the polls, it is pretty clear that he's going to win this race, probably by about six, seven, eight percent, maybe even more given the fact that like you have the governor's race in Ohio where the governor candidate, um, Mike DeWine, he's like leading now by even higher than 15% against his opponent. And so it's clear that the average voters in Ohio are shifting towards the Republicans. And so you're going to have at least two new senators that are going to be against the current aid to Ukraine. And then in New Hampshire, there is the race between Maggie Hassan and Dan Bulduck. And so the Dan Bulduck, he is also opposed to AT Ukraine, but he is not likely to win his race. Really, the race has been tightening up in recent days, but Maggie Hassan still has a lead over here. And Dan Bulduck, he barely has any resources he was just completely ignored by the national republicans the national republicans were pouring in money to a bunch of different races um, most notably like pennsylvania where you have a um, dr oz running for the republicans they also poured a lot of money into like texas or to florida a bunch of these different states but really new hampshire was ignored and this was a bit of a mistake from the republicans because the state is relatively close and if the Republican candidate here had the sufficient resources, he might have been able to win. But given the fact that he doesn't and that um, the Democrats are leading in this area, they're probably going to take it, although it will be very slim. So again, these changes are not enough to change anything in America's policy in regards to Ukraine. In terms of a new aid bill that could be passed by Ukraine um, for Ukraine, I have a list of several weapon systems that could be included. I think that this time, given the influx of Shahid drones into Russia, there's going to be an emphasis on anti-air systems and anti-drone systems. A lot of these radar de detection systems, for instance. Also, we're going to see a lot of support for additional HIMAR systems because these have really been popularized by the media and by a lot of politicians and so you can see potentially some new systems being sent some new munitions being sent into um, recently raytheon has sent the u.s government two new nasm's air defense systems and so those are now being installed in ukraine so you could see more of those being produced in the coming months if an aid bill is passed Specifically for counter drone systems, there's the Vampire counter drone system, there's the Stinger anti-air systems, 
perhaps to deal with the Black Sea fleets, there could be additional Harpoon anti-ship missiles, which are sent to Ukraine. Those were probably used to sink the Moskva. And then, of course, some more AGM-88 Harm air-to-surface anti-radiation missiles. These have been sent already by the U.S., but we don't exactly know the quantity of these. The United States has been very secretive about their dealings in regards to this specific weapon. And so we could see more of these being sent in the future. There's also a lot of pressure from the pro-Ukrainian crowd to get um, attackums sent to Ukraine. This could be perhaps uh, a big development if the United States allows Ukraine to use the attackums to strike targets within Russian territory because this has a 300 kilometer range and it could be launched from the tracked M270 MLRS or from the high Mars. And so it is, uh, it could potentially lead to a lot of damage to Russian forces that are sending reinforcements through Crimea. Again, it could hit the Crimean bridge, potentially. It could hit a lot of logistic centers that are near the Russia-Ukraine border. And so we're going to have to see if that gets passed, but it does seem that it would be less likely in a Republican-dominated house because of the idea that it could potentially escalate the situation with Russia, especially if it is allowed, uh, if Ukraine is allowed to use these on Russian territory. And Ukraine is really keeping an eye out for how these results play out. Really, they probably don't care about who wins if, as long as they're not America first candidates, because those sort of candidates like Blake Masters and JD Vance would directly harm their interests. If you had a JD Vance winning in every single Senate election, that would mean the stop of any sort of new military aid to Ukraine. It would also mean that there would be no sanctions on Russia. Maybe some of the ones that are currently existing would be uh, scaled down. Perhaps they would uh, pressure Biden into working on a ceasefire, although Biden would still have the sole authority to conduct whatever he wants as the chief executive. And so really, the Senate and the House are confined to just voting on laws. And so that can sort of create a stalemate between the legislative and executive branches, which is something that happened for Trump in 2018 when he lost the House in the midterms. And that would only be amplified for Biden if he were to lose not only the House, but also the Senate. So if you're interested in seeing the like my specific prediction for what would happen in the races for the House and the Senate and the governor's elections, just tell me and I'll make those videos. So thank you all for watching.